understand. Thanks, Mr. Mathis. Josh, come on up. It is my pleasure and honor to bring tonight to the board meeting uh, Josh Bunyard, our senior swimmer who was a WPIL champion this past season, as well as a PIAA champion as well in the 100 backstroke. Um, Josh has signed to continue swimming at The Ohio State University and he's going to plan the major in environmental science. I did some record digging. Uh, it is believed that he's the only male state champion that North Hills has ever had in swimming. So that's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Currently, he's ranked the 13th overall swimmer slash recruit in the state of Pennsylvania per college swimming. And he's been a WPIL and a state qualifier for all four years in his high school career. In the WPIL in ninth grade, he was a part of the 200 freestyle relay team that finished fourth place. In 10th grade, he was sixth in the 100 backstroke. In 11th grade, he was a second place finisher in the 100 freestyle and a second place finisher in the 100 back. And this year as a senior, he won the 100 freestyle with a time of 45.52, placing him first in the Whippeal, and the first place finish in the 100 backstroke at the Whippeal finals with a time of 49.08, and that was an upper St. Clair pool record when he set that. It is great and amazing to hear that as he got and grew through his career, in the state, he qualified but as a senior, he was a champion in the 100 backstroke with 49.07, and that's an All-American time. And he got the fourth place finish in the 100 freestyle at 45.65. When I talked to Josh yesterday, he wanted to make sure that he went from 23rd to 1st in the backstroke. So that's impressive. Um, and it's just kudos to his hard work and his dedication that he's, he's done that. Right now he's training for the 18 and under spring cup that's held by USA Swimming and that's going to take place in Richmond, Virginia from April 29th to May 2nd. And when he's not swimming, Josh enjoys taking pictures of nature, landscape, and people as per his Instagram page. Check him out at Boggs Picks. Um, we are honored tonight to have his parents here as well as assistant coach Shannon Metzler uh, to honor Josh. So. With great honor, Josh Bunyard, Whippeal and PIAA champion. Congratulations, Josh.
congratulations again, Josh. We wish you the best of luck. That's awesome. All right, hopefully this is going to be brief because I get to begin your death by PowerPoint tonight. <laughs> so unfortunately, um, I think everybody knows that based upon the case counts in the county, uh, Allegheny County has slipped back into substantial, but the, I guess the good news behind that is that they've also changed some of the guidance out of the state of Pennsylvania. So long story short for the North Hill School District is we are operating in a hybrid or blended model by the definition of the state. The Wednesday virtual option allows us to be able to continue as a hybrid model. So the Wednesday virtual option is going to stay through May 27th. We published our calendars last time in April, uh, for April and May. And you can see those virtual Wednesdays are really for the next five weeks. And then after that, we will finish off the year with a full day. Um, the last two weeks are only four day weeks, so they will be full in person those last two weeks in May. Uh, but that's what allows us to maintain a hybrid or a blended model. So. Uh, that's where we are. The big thing with this being back to substantial is that at this point we are now required to follow the closure pro protocols as recommended by the health department. So again, every case we have, we contact the health department, have a conversation with them. Uh, we are tracking our cases in that 14-day rolling window to the day that they are uh, beginning their symptoms. And then we will have a conversation with the Allegheny County Health Department if any of our schools reach those thresholds to the potential of closing. And again, that's a decision that's made by the health department in collaboration with us based upon the number of cases that we have. So that's where we are with community transmission levels um, and as far as our schedule is concerned over the next uh, eight weeks of school. But the good news is we're going to continue with some of our annual track and field events. On Friday, May 7th at Monterey Stadium, we're going to have 350 fifth graders from all four of our elementary schools participate in their annual transition to middle school event with the track and field day. Um, the athletics and the health, the health and safety plan will be in effect with social distancing, hand sanitizing stations, and masks will be required uh, for all events except for those or for all participants except for whenever they are participating in an actual event. There will be no spectators, unfortunately. Um, this event will be just for the students and for the staff to be able to kind of manage the events and manage the day for our students. Um, but there will be uh, lots of pictures and videos that will be shared through our social media. I want to just thank the PE department for making this a possible event. I know they've been working hard for the last couple of months to try to figure out a way that we can have this event and keep students safe, uh, create some different events for them so that uh, there's not too much idle time or dead time for them to be just kind of sitting around on the field or at the track. So the good news is we're able to do this. We're able to do it safely um, and we're able to have that track and field day that is so important to us that unfortunately we had to miss last year. So with that being said, we're also planning field days at each of our elementary schools. And you can see at High Cliff and at McIntyre on Monday, May 17th will be their field day. And at Ross and at Westview on Friday, May 14th will be their field day. At the same time, the week of May 10th is going to be the middle school field days. There will be one field day, there will be one field day for each of the grades 6, 7, and 8. Um, and we're doing it the week of May 10th. So that in the event there is rain, we have a couple of weeks to be able to make sure that those events are able to take place for our students. Um, this is going to be a little bit different since it's going to be on the hilltop. That it'll be a carnival style atmosphere with track and field events occurring pretty much on the baseball field, uh, on the tennis courts. Um, and we're going to utilize the parking lot. So we're going to have some different games for them in the grassy areas of the hilltop. Whether it's cornhole or ring toss or I think it's called ladder ball or as I like to call it golf ball tossy thingy. So, as we move to the summer, our iPads, as you recall, are leased. In the past, we didn't have 4,600 iPads out there in circulation. It was pretty much, you know, a, a 7 through 12, 7 through 11 endeavor. It was easy for us to be able to collect those iPads, redistribute them the next year to that group of students. Now that we're 4,600 iPads in the hands of students, we've been talking a lot about allowing the students to keep their iPads for the summer, and then bring them back on the first day of school next year. So this is the plan that we put forward. If a parent would like to have their child keep their iPad over the summer, they can. Um, I, it is encouraged and it's required if you're going to participate in any of the district's summer learning programs. So if you're planning on your child participating in any of those summer programs that we've talked about over the last couple of meetings, your child's going to need their iPad. So that's an important thing to notice. Um, to keep the device, um, you have to complete and submit an online form. And so that's going to be available on our website. 
Uh, please review the technology policies and user agreements because those will still be in effect. Again, this is a district device. It's not a personal device. Um, we're just, again, allowing you to keep those over the summer. For support, again, it's a district device. You cannot take it to a third party to have any of the damages fixed, you know, whether it's a broken screen or you take it to the Apple store. They're going to tell you to bring it back to us. Okay, so we are going to have uh, a support portal available, and our, we'll be able to technical troubleshoot and fix iPad devices all throughout the summer. So if anything happens to it, or there's broken or anything, you can bring them in here to be fixed. You are responsible for a lost iPad or a broken iPad. When we get to the beginning of the school year, you will have to pay for all damages. But the good news is that the insurance goes through the first day of school. So if you have insurance, and something were to happen to that device over the summer, the insurance will cover it. Uh, but you are responsible for damages and lost iPads when we get to the beginning of the school year. What if you don't want it? All right, good. So if you don't want to keep your iPad over the summer and you'd like us to keep it safe and secure for your child, uh, you can simply return the device in its case with its charging cord and the block that uh, helps us to charge it on the student's last day of school. We'll have you know, greater details about who you give that to. It's most certainly going to be their homeroom teacher. We will collect them from there and then move that iPad to your child's next homeroom teacher so that it's there for them on the first day of school when they arrive here in August. And we will also make sure that you receive a receipt so that we know and you both then you know that that device is in the district. Okay? So if you're looking to keep that iPad over the summer, you certainly can. Please fill out the, the uh, form on the website. If you don't want it, you're going to be able to turn that into us on the last day of school like we always have. A new feature that uh, we've been working with over the last couple of weeks, and we finally got this feature really to the point where we wanted it, and it's called Jamf Parent. So Jamf is the system that manages our 4,600 iPads. Uh, Jamf Parent will now allow you to manage your child's iPad through an iOS device. It has to be an iOS device. It's either an, uh, an Apple iPhone or an Apple iPad. It will not work on Android, unfortunately. But if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you'll be able to manage your child's device. You can restrict apps. You can restrict app categories, including social media, games, and music. You can limit screen time. You can create schedules based upon your child's routine. That if you, for example, said to your child, when you are home, you have to do homework between 6 and 8. So between 6 and 8, the following apps are not available to your child. You'll be able to schedule when the iPad sees the apps and when it does not see the apps. Um, this will be, these, all these features will be disabled while the children are in the district. Okay, so the parent will not be able to turn on and off apps while the child is in the district in a learning environment. Um, at that point, the district controls the apps during school hours. There will be a video tutorial and a step-by-step -step instruction uh, on our website so that if this is something you are interested in, that you would like to gain control over the parental, basically parental settings on your child's iPad, you certainly can do that. It's called Jam Parent, and the instructions are available on the website. Okay, so a lot of things I've been dealing with this week has been the Duquesne Light Project in the Brookmead area. So Brookmead is an area that has underground wiring, and fortunately, and unfortunately, Duquesne Light is beginning a project starting on Monday to replace the underground wiring. So the bad news for us is that we don't know how this project is going to progress. When, where, how fast, uh, as they're wiring each house individually, we don't know what they're going to run into. We don't know how long it's going to take. But the issue that we're going to run into is we have five virtual Wednesdays remaining. And so if you have a house that is without power, they are without internet, and there's no way for their children to be educated that day. So uh, I talked to uh, a couple of people at Ross Township. There's no way with a project this size we can ask them to not work on Wednesdays. It's just not possible. So we came up with plan B. And the unfortunate part about this plan, also, you as a person in Brookmead is not going to know that your power is going to be out the next day until 5 o'clock that day. So it's not like we can plan for this. It's not like we even know which houses are going to be affected and when. So what we're going to do, we spoke to ABC Transit. ABC Transit will take a bus into the Brookmead development on the virtual Wednesdays that we have. If you are a family that is going to be without power on a virtual Wednesday, put your child on the bus. Our buildings are open. Our buildings are staffed. Uh, our libraries will be open, and they will be, uh, we will have adults in there to monitor the students. Bring your iPad, bring your headphones. Students can be in the library to learn that day. 
We are also feeding with our uh, grab-and-go lunches so the cafeteria is open for students, and then we can put them on the bus and take them home that day as well. So if you are in that situation where power is going to be out in your house on a virtual Wednesday, you don't have a hot spot or something like that that you could link into that day, you can put your child on a bus and send them to school and we'll take care of them. So um, that's the only real contingency plan we were able to come up with, and particularly whenever we don't know. We don't know what day your house is going to be uh, out of power, for how long, who and when, so I think this is the best that we could do. So that way our students can still be educated on those days that they're virtual or the event that their house is without power, they can come into the school. That is only for those that are impacted by the power failure. That is not for all students at Brookmead to come to school on Wednesdays. And lastly tonight, uh, I'm able to announce that Yesterday, David Lieberman made an uh, announcement to his faculty that he is retiring. It's something that the board has known about for about a month, but we wanted to give him the opportunity to uh, notify his faculty. So he notified his faculty yesterday. So I'd just like to congratulate Dave. He joined our district in 1997 as a high school math teacher. He became my assistant principal in 2006 when I was the high school principal. He was then promoted to the Ross principal in 2008. Became our middle school principal in 2015, and congratulations, Dave has decided to retire this year, and his last day in the district will be July 31st. We will be posting for the middle school principal position tomorrow, um, because it's not, uh, there's not too many days between now and July 31st. So <laughs> we're going to have to get this process rolling as we search for our next middle school principal. So uh, I just wanted to take an opportunity formally to congratulate Dave and wish Dave the best um, since we're able to make that announcement official. And that's all I have. And anybody have any questions? So again, the North Hill School District doesn't quarantine, Allegheny County Health Department does. We work with them to identify close contacts and then they quarantine, but because it's going to take them so long to notify you, if it's your household, our nurses are making the phone calls so that our families know that they are a close contact and they are being quarantined, but we're not quarantining you, the health department is. Okay, the next question is, anytime we, so CDC has said that we are safe inside of three feet in schools. And we are. So the closest our students are is four feet in any of our classrooms. Most of them are four and a half. Uh, they are six feet in the cafeterias with masks off, all that fun stuff you already know about. What they have not changed is the close contact distance. The close contact distance remains six feet. So in the event we have a positive case and that child is in the school, we have to work with the health department to establish a list of students they are going to quarantine that are inside that six foot bubble. So anytime we have a case, we are about 18 to 22 students that were quarantining because of the bus as well. Um, we just, I just did a survey for Allegheny County. So since we came back to school uh, in January, February, I think it is now. Since February, we have, the district in Allegheny County has had to quarantine to about 260 students. That was as of yesterday. So we had a few cases today, but as I said, any case that we get is normally, if they're in school the day that they are exhibiting symptoms, it's about 20, 18 to 22 students. Okay, thank you. The other good news behind that is part of the survey as well. Of that 260 or so that we've quarantined, we've had four positive cases that were connected to any of those situations, and Allegheny County is not even certain that they were, as a result of being in our quarantine list, because they were sick at the beginning of the quarantine, so they may have been exposed prior to being identified as a close contact. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I've been advised that we all need to really speak into our microphones so that the people on Zoom can hear us. So, um, Are there any other questions on Pat, uh, Dr. Manorino's presentation? I have a, a, a question. Let, just theoretically, if someone has lost 
the iPad case or the plug, um, <laughs> what what should they do? What would what what happens then? Just, just theoretically. So they're like ten thousand dollars a piece. Okay. <laughs> Just notify your principal, they'll help us to track it down. Um, the, the cords and the cables, I get that. I mean, they're going to disappear. We know that. It's a minimal expense in order to replace it, but that's how it's going to go. Whenever we have to collect them, you're going to be responsible to turn in the plug and the cord. If you don't have it, it's whatever the cost of that plug or cord is to replace it at that time. Um, the cases, we can always get another case. Now, those are not keyboard cases, right? They're the rubber bumper cases. I'm not sure how much those are. Uh, Jerry, do you know offhand how much they are? No, no, they're not that expensive. Yeah, they're not. I, I, I they're want like to say they're 20, yeah, they're, they're like 20 or $30. So yeah, that's all district uh, owned equipment. And so we will have to either collect it or collect for it when the time comes. So keep searching. <laughs> Any other questions from the board members present now? Uh, do, uh, Either of the board members on Zoom have any questions or comments? If you do, unmute yourself and speak. Okay. I'll take that as a no. Um, all right. Next, we are going to move on to public comments on agenda items only. It doesn't seem that we have anybody here in person that would make a public comment. Do we have anybody on Zoom um, participating virtually that would like to make a public comment? We do have some participants, but no one raised their hand. Okay, so if you are attending on Zoom and you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand uh, virtually now, and we will read the participation policy and bring you up to speak. All right, next we'll move on to finance, which I will be taking this evening because Dr. Nolish is not here. Um, the first item we have for you is a presentation from Mr. Justin Vancheri um, with the district's audited financial statements from the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. Thank you. Uh, if you can't hear me, if you have any trouble, please let me know. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to give you the short summary over the 630-20 financial statements. Uh, if at any time there's you know, any questions, please let me know, okay. and we can answer them, or at the end, I'll definitely answer questions as well. Um, so basically, the first most important thing is the independent auditor's report. Uh, so at 630-20, we issued an unmodified opinion. What that means is your financial statements present fairly in all material respects with the basis of account. Uh, that is the highest opinion that we can give as independent auditors. Uh, that is the opinion that you as a board want. What that means is your financial statements are good. There are no problems noticed during the audit. Uh, moving on to the governmental funds, going over the balance sheet. In uh, the general fund at 630.20, you had non-spendable funds of $290,000. Uh, what the majority of that was prepaid expenses for future health care costs. You had assigned funds of right around $7.5 million. Uh, once again, those are assigned for future other post-employment benefit costs and future PEASER's retirement costs. And then you had unassigned funds of $5.2 million. Uh, that 5.2, that gets you right around 6.25% of your budgeted expenditures. Uh, that's right up within the guidelines of where the state wants a district your size to be, so that's a very positive number to have there. Uh, the district also has a capital projects fund. At 630.20, you had committed funds of right around $3.6 million, obviously committed for future capital expenditures. Uh, and the district also has a debt service fund uh, with funds in there, about $164,000, obviously for future debt expenditures. Moving on to the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. Uh, total revenues for the year were $83 million. Uh, you had expenditures around $82.2 million. You had other financing sources and uses, right around 1.1 million, uh, the largest of that being uh, the leases for the iPads that were had during the year, for a total change in fund balance during the year of $1.9 million to the positive. Uh, if you look right below that, you can see that during the year, the district was budgeting a loss of $1.1 million. Uh, 
When I go down to the next section, we'll explain exactly where those variances came in and the reason for that change there. Uh, so at, in your general fund budget tab, so I'm going to go over just the totals here. Uh, your revenues were over budget, $1.8 million, or roughly 2.2%. Uh, in that number, if we remove the issuance of the capital lease, which are usually not uh, budgeted for, especially this year, you know, it came in at the end, that would get you with over budget of $226,000. Uh, so being over budget, about $200,000 on an $80 million budget on the revenue side, uh, that's phenomenal. It tells us as your auditors that basically management is budgeting on a realistic uh, it's expectation and they're constantly monitoring that, so that's very good. Uh, during the year, the expenditures were under budget, right around $1.1 million, or roughly 1.4%. Uh, we always tell all of our districts, basically anywhere below 3%, that tells us that they're doing a good job, especially this year, what we've seen districts wide, we do about 35 school districts, uh, most school districts were under budget in the expenditures. Uh, we anticipate that going into the current year you're in, that that number to flip and be over budget on expenditures. Just with the, sh the way the shutdown ended, and by the time goods were actually received by the district, a lot of that, uh, those expenditures got pushed into the new year as well. Uh, to kind of break down your revenues a little bit further, uh, your local revenues were about $62 million, uh, state funds about $20 million, Federal funds in the general fund, about $751,000. And other financing sources, about $1.6 million. To break down the uh, expenditures, about $52 million. Support services, about $20.1 million. Non-instructional services, $1.4. Uh, total debt service expenditures for the year, right around $8 million. And then a transfer to other fund, it was a transfer to the capital projects fund, of right around $520,000. Uh, kind of going over the other funds the district has. The capital projects fund during the year had about $73,000 in revenues. Uh, that was all interest earnings. About $800,000 in expenditures. Uh, that was related to some roof repairs and roof replacements that were finally finished up in the current year. Uh, and then as I mentioned previously, the transfer from the general fund of $520,000 for a total change in fund balance, a loss of $290,000. For the debt service fund, uh, local sources, obviously that's interest earnings right around $3,400. $3, uh, the expenditures and the other financing sources and uses, uh, those combined, those are mainly related to the refunding of debt the district did in October of 2019. Uh, I'll kind of get into the particulars of those numbers when we get down to the debt section on the footnote side. Um, but there's a lot of uh, payments out and refunding the bonds in those numbers. Uh, to get you at a total change in fund balance in your debt service fund, the loss of $54,000. Uh, the district also has a food service fund. Uh, all we like to do here, we like to just point out the change in net position for the year ended. Uh, this number does exclude any adjustment related to the net pension liability uh, that's associated with that fund. Uh, as you can see here, on June 30, 2020, you had a loss of $192,000. When you're comparing that to the previous year of a gain of about $145,000, one thing to keep in mind with this fund is overall, if you looked at it over a 10 year span, the idea would be that it would all net out to zero income. So last year we had a, a higher income. This year, obviously, you know, that could have flipped a little bit. And then with school being shut down, once again, that's what we're seeing pretty much uh, across all of our schools there. Uh, kind of going into the footnotes, there's about 60 pages of footnotes in the actual financial statement, so I'm just going to touch upon some of the highlighted ones here. Uh, obviously, the largest of that being the net pension liability associated with PEASERS. Uh, so your net pension liability at 630.20 is $122.8 million. Uh, obviously, that's a very large number. To put that into perspective, your overall percentage of the total PEASERS liability is about 0.24%. Uh, so the total PEASERS liability actually went down a little bit to about $44 billion. Uh, you have a very small percentage, it still turns into a very large number. Uh, one thing I always like to remind everyone with this number especially, this is not a liability like a loan payable or a bond payable that you can pay off early. The district is making all the required contributions that they're required to make each year uh, to, to pay that off based on the, upon the percentages uh, that PEASERS requires. Uh, moving to the probably the other largest item on your uh, in the footnotes there, the long-term debt sections. 
At 630.20, you have general obligation bonds of roughly $46.6 million outstanding. Uh, as I mentioned, during the year, there was an issuance of the 2019 series bonds of $15.8 million. Uh, that was used to refund the series 2010 bond that of a value of about $17.2 million. So if you look at that principal retired number there, in total of 22.7, in that number is that 17.2 uh, of the 2010 bonds that were retired based on the refund. Uh, you also have general obligation notes outstanding, right around $1.6 million. Uh, of that during the year, you paid off principal in the amount of $142,000. The district overall did have expenditures over $750,000 for federal awarded funds. Uh, because of that, we were required to do a complete a single audit. Uh, the total amount of federal awards that you were awarded or spent during the year, excuse me, was $1.9 million. Uh, when we completed our single audit, we issued unmodified opinions on that and no compliance findings associated with that separate audit along those lines with those federal funds. Uh, you know, obviously another big thank you to Jerry and his staff. You know, I know there's a lot going on. The school district, especially over the past year, year and a half, you guys have constantly dealing with uh, changing environments, new things all the time. So, uh, you know, thank you for everyone in the administrative office to allow us to come out and complete our audit and uh, assisting us with this. Uh, any questions? Don't have any to say. Just a, a clerk, you didn't. I mean, I, I think this is pretty inherent in there. But there were there were no major liabilities, major concerns, major like differences between our district and other districts that would cause you alarm as part of this audit. Correct. Now, basically, what we look at, you know, especially a district like yours, we do uh, some very similar areas. Uh, you guys are pretty much in line with every other district that we do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say I want to thank Jerry. Uh, this report here proves that you are amazing at your job. So I just want to say thank you for that and the administration uh, for keeping those spending in check. I mean, kudos to you. And one other comment has nothing to do with this, but it keeps on being brought up and, and the news article just came out. I, I keep on hearing this word piecers over and over again. And, you know, we as a district and, and districts across this commonwealth spend countless amounts of dollars feeding into this piece response, as well as teachers, right? And we see just yesterday a news report coming out that the, the FBI is giving subpoenas, serving subpoenas on managers of those funds. And, and it really is just disheartening when we see dollars walk out of here, less opportunities for our kids. Our teachers are working hard and putting in a retirement system. And now we see that the managers of these funds are being uh, subpoenaed by federal authorities. And it's very, very disheartening when you see that. I, I just hope that there's something that can be done there. Um, it's just not not on you, but just I, I just see it. It's very aggravating. It's very aggravating. Uh, do either of our participants on Zoom have any questions or comments? Okay. I'm poor Heather. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for coming this evening. We appreciate all of your work and the presentation. Of course. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda, we have Jerry Muth here to give us a status update on the 2021-2022 general fund budget. Good evening. Um, I kind of was appreciative that Justin could present those financial statements tonight because it kind of gives us perspective as to where were we, where we were at at the beginning of this fiscal year and gives us a flavor as to where we're at going forward. Before I get into that, I just want to point out some key dates of uh, relevance. Um, the proposed final budget will be presented for board approval on April 29th. There will be a public budget meeting on May 5th to discuss in detail the proposed final budget. And then on June 3rd, tentatively, the board votes on the final budget, real estate taxes and homestead exclusion. Keep in mind, what I present tonight will not necessarily be where we will, um, what we will propose come April 29th. What I propose tonight, and, or on the 29th, may not be where we wind up on June 3rd. 
It is a dynamic process that began back in December. Uh, various departments went through with the teachers, uh, department heads, administrators, to determine what their needs were. They went through a process of identifying what truly are needs versus wants. And then that was presented to us internally in the month of March. We sat down with the department heads and walked through painstakingly, line by line if necessary, their budgets to come up with where we stand tonight. At this point in time, the budget for 21-22 for revenues is relatively flat. The reason for that primarily is the pandemic. Um, we were somewhat optimistic, or I should say I was somewhat optimistic, that the pandemic wouldn't last as long as it did into 2020, 2021. But it definitely has had a depressing impact on certain levels of revenue that we have had. Um, that being said, we're seeing somewhat of a turnaround in the latter part of this year, and our local sources remain relatively the same state sources remain relatively the same and the federal sources are increasing uh, we'll discuss that a little bit further uh, later on but basically we're proposing a flat revenue change for the upcoming fiscal year the primary components of the local sources remains our real estate taxes we have collected roughly 50.7 million as was budgeted for the 2020-2021 school year shown above and the assessed values that we currently have in hand are not much more significant than that, so we don't anticipate much of an increase for the next school year. What is impressive to us at this point in time is that despite the pandemic and the impact on a lot of families throughout the country and in the township and the borough, our earned income tax collections thus far through March are actually at the same level as they were last year. Um, with that being said, uh, additionally for mercantile business privilege taxes, they're slightly down, but I'm somewhat more optimistic than I was a few months ago as to what our collections will be going forward and its impact on the 2021-2022 budget. Um, these may change before we get to that point. State subsidies pretty much remain flat. The primary components of that is a basic education subsidy that sits at approximately $6.2 a special education subsidy that sits at about 2.5 million. We are also reimbursed for 50% of our contributions for Social Security and the pension, the PEASERS that was previously mentioned, and that's approximately 6.7 million, I believe. And we also are reimbursed for transportation and debt service. The transportation subsidy is anticipated to decrease next year, and the result that results from what we pay currently for transportation. We basically are reimbursed in the succeeding year based on a percentage of what we pay in the current year. Because we were out of uh, session, we were doing a lot of virtual sessions earlier in the year. We did not have any transportation costs at that point in time. So our reimbursement, obviously, of a smaller amount will generate smaller revenue next year. The federal title programs are the primary components historically and currently. Um, Title programs, Title I, Title II, and Title IV. Title I is typically used for reading specialists and a math coach, so to speak. Uh, it pays for a portion of their salaries and benefits. Title II is used for classroom size reduction. And likewise, Title IV is a permissible to be used for Title II purposes. So that, too, goes towards the uh, classroom size reduction salaries and benefits for two teachers. On the expenditure side, the primary drivers, again, are salaries and benefits. Our biggest investment is in our people, and that continues to be the case. As was previously pointed out, the largest portion of our benefits um, is the contributions that we make to the retirement system. We currently pay 0.3494% uh, for contributions to the retirement system. We also have, for the first time in several years, a slight increase in the medical insurance benefits. It's actually at 5%, but historically that has been a very manageable expenditure for us, and we're fortunate to share the risks with other school districts in the area in that program. The next line item is basically supplies and equipment. We budgeted a little less for the current school year 
uh, based on primarily making the investment in the iPads in the previous school year. We anticipate that, that may go up again in the next school year. Uh, debt services and other uses remain relatively the same. The only difference between the current year and next year is there is a $500,000 contribution to the capital projects fund that is currently in the 2021-2022 budget. I also failed to discuss the purchase of services. That basically is our tuition, transportation, and technology assistance. Uh, transportation makes up approximately $3 million of that. Tuition is equally at that level, and technology purchase services and related other purchase services is much less substantial than that. Within the expenditure variables in the next year, we have four pupil positions that are currently being proposed and are included in that budget. They represent the salaries and benefits for a school nurse, a social worker, a school psychologist, and a school a student assistance counselor. Those are currently in there. They are currently being determined whether we want to include all four or a lesser number than that. But currently, they have an impact of $289,000 on next year's budget. Likewise, we have currently plans to hold an online learning uh, taught by our own personnel. And there are seven positions within the budget currently, which approximate $400,000. Right now, the interest in that program is very low. So that is a number that may be subject to change depending upon whether there's increased participation or not. There is a school of thought that contingent upon conditions as we progress through the summer, the interest level may progress. So it is a variable that's in the budget currently. Uh, it's something we're keeping an eye on as to whether or not that's an opportunity, perhaps to reduce expenditures if necessary. Likewise, there are eight delayed positions within the budget. That is something that historically we have always had that is to uh, address potentially increased enrollment throughout the district as we get closer to the school year. Uh, currently, there's eight, as I said, in there with a $454,000 potential impact. Again, there may be some flexibility as we get better sense as to what our enrollment is going to be. The other two variables uh, currently that are not necessarily um, definitively known at this point is we are currently in negotiations with the ESPA bargaining uh, unit, and we also have a transportation services contract, which is up at June 30th. We currently have a request for proposals out for transportation contractors, and we anticipate having those submitted to us by April 22nd, at which time we will evaluate and then make a determination whether to proceed with a new company or the existing one. The budgetary impact at this point in time is unknown. So where does that leave us? Currently, we are sitting at a projected deficit position of $3.7 million. And it seems kind of gloomy, but if you look back historically at where we stand most years, we are somewhat in a deficit position at this point in time until we fine tune our expenditures, identify potential resources of revenue, um, or other financing uses. The next slide I'm gonna propose prepare and show to you, I guess, is not in any order of preference. It is not in any order of what is going to happen. It is just what is available on the table to us currently. So right now, previously earlier in the year, the board authorized that if necessary, we could raise real estate taxes to the index, which was 3.5%. If we elected to raise real estate taxes by the max, it would generate $1.9 million. As previously presented during the audit, uh, the auditor pointed out that we also have an assigned fund balance, a portion of which is for the post-retirement system. The, I'm sorry, the planned retirement system. Public service employee retirement system, I apologize. Um, it's $1.8 million available to us right now. What it was not emphasized enough, I think, in the previous presentation was we actually anticipated using that fund balance in the 1920 school year. We did not use that. So that is available to us again at this point in time, and even a larger amount is available. We also recently 
were allocated tentatively under the American Rescue Plan funding, $2.9 million. 20% of that must be geared towards learning loss, which is about $581,000. The rest, we have not yet been given strict guidelines as to how those may be used. The funding is available through September of 2024. Tentatively, it would make sense to us to split that over the course of three, the next three fiscal years and make a determination as to how best to use those funds. But again, those are the three primary sources right now of revenue that are available to us. On a much more tentative basis, the governor's current budget also has projected increases for the uh, basic education subsidy and the special education subsidy. The catch is currently those are tied to a targeted personal income tax, which more than likely is going to have some resistance. So the likelihood of that one is a little bit suspect at this point in time, whereas the three above are known factors. So that is where we stand at this point in time. Again, it's a dynamic process. We are continuing to look to reduce expenditures and also look for alternative sources of revenue. During the public budget meetings that we have had thus far, uh, although the attendance has been low, I've been impressed by the questions and the suggestions. Uh, things like, if we're sitting on a substantial fund balance of $13 million, why don't we consider paying down some debt and reduce our interest expenditures in the future? It's something we can take a look at. Other suggestions have been, why not look into pursuing uh, appeals for those properties that are currently being sold that are valued at the county assessed, uh, assessed at the county level at a much lower amount. Things of that nature are something that we can definitely give consideration to. That's where we stand at this moment, and I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Muth. Uh, do any board members have questions or comments on the presentation or the budget? I mean, I, I, I'll say what I've said to you in, in conversations and, and several of my colleagues is that you may mention of uh, the assessing those property values based, based off of what they sold versus what's on, let's just say, the books. And you know, I really do believe that we're leaving a lot of money there. That, you know, uh, without having to raise taxes, there's additional revenues there that we could generate here in the district. So um, it's something I'm, I'm a big supporter of. Um, but you know, you mentioned that there, and I really think that that could be a big win here for the district. I would say likewise, the charter school tuition proposal that was put forth in the budget where they were trying to set a standard a rate rather than basing it on the individual school district's expenditures, too, would be a benefit to us as well, as you previously mentioned. Sure, they'd be said 9500 absolutely. Do you know what the financial impact would be if that passes, the charter school reform? I believe it was going to reduce our impact by seven to $800,000. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, are there, what potential drawbacks are there, if any, of using the PISERS assigned fund balance, um, the, those funds? Um. Quite frankly, they were set aside for this specific reason, uh, the increases that were going on in the PISERS rate. Um, it has been accumulating for a period of several years, and as Justin pointed out, we're in a very healthy position with our fund balance currently. Um, so it would have no negative impact if an outside entity was looking at us if we wanted to get more lending for example if we use that fund balance it would not impact them and say wow you guys look like you're in a dire financial position right we have a very strong fund balance at this point in time. and it's not the kind of thing where you know like, like the um the american rescue plan funding that's that's we have that and that's going to go away absolutely after a certain number of time like that's not that that impact is not um it's not a comparable sort of impact where we would apply that money this year if we just decided to, and then next year we'd be that much in more in, the, in you know kind of trying to scramble to figure out where that money's coming from. That's yeah. not the, the situation with that money. The cautionary tale that's going around is if you go back about 10 years when the other stimulus package came through, there are a lot of school districts that used that funding to bridge a gap, right, and then almost had to raise taxes. Ridiculously right, not. Twice as much. Exactly. That's not, the, that's and that's not, not the, the kind of approach we would like to take at this point. Right. Okay. 
Do any of the board members on Zoom have any questions? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Deanna. Can you all hear me? Yes. I was just wondering if there's any thought to having the May public budget meeting virtually for the board people could potentially attend? I guess my preference would be to do one live and one virtual rather than do separate. I don't, I, I like the, personally, I like the in person interaction. Um, but I definitely will do a virtual one because I've had other requests for that. Any other questions from Zoom? No? Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much, Mr. Muth. All right. Uh, moving on to the finance items that will be moving on to the legislative meeting. Um, first, I have a request for the board to approve the audited financial statements for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020 for the attached and the presentation, which we saw earlier. A request for the board to approve the renewal of the contract with Quest Tech for educational technology management from Ju July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2025. The existing agreement extension ends June 30th, 2021. The extension presented for approval includes no cost increases for the next two fiscal years and a 2.5% cost increase annually thereafter. This compares favorably to the existing contract, which increases costs 2.5% annually for all four years of the contract. We have then some standard bills, the general fund bills, the food service fund bills, budget transfers, and payroll for the month of March 2021 in the amount of $3,178,120.82. I move that finance items four through nine be added to the legislative meeting agenda. There a second? No second that, please, Spade. Thank you, Mrs. Spade. Um, I'd like to uh, ask if there are any questions, and I'll, I'll begin with a question on item number five. Um, Regarding uh, Quest Tech, I have two questions. I don't know if it's for Mr. Muth or Dr. Manorino, but um, I was curious as to why we outsource this as opposed to um, doing this in-house. And then my second question was um, if we had received or considered receiving any comparable bids for these services. Two great questions, I'll take a vote. <laughs> so it's something we decided 10 years ago to begin to outsource the management of our technology services. And a lot of it is based upon cost. Um, our employees drive the cost of all of it, like Jerry had said before. Um, our Quest Tech employees are not employees of the district, they're employees of Quest Tech. And uh, so there are certain things like the PSERS fund that we don't pay for those employees, and that's a significant driving factor of this. Uh, we've had a relationship with Quest Tech now for 15 years. At one point, it was just the director of technology position that was outsourced. Uh, we've outsourced the entire technology management staff since then, I think three agreements ago with Quest Tech. So um, there's a lot of inherent knowledge that the company has of the district, um, the inner workings of the infrastructures and the technology and the passwords. And uh, I don't think it's something for the security of the district to RFP and ask for others to bid on this whenever I'm comfortable with what Quest Tech does for the district. It is, uh, you know, they're giving us a bargain as far as no cost increase for the next two years, so it's a favorable contract for the district. And there's other you know, pieces of that relationship when it comes to the replacement of employees that benefits the district as well. So uh, I didn't see a reason that we would want to outsource or ask for others to get into a conversation about one of the most important uh, security features that the district has. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll take a roll call vote. Ms. Cozero? Aye. Dr. Little? Aye. Ms. Aye. Philpott? Oh, you Mr. Little? Yeah, that's okay, you can keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ms. Philpott? Aye. Mrs. Ponytowski? Aye. Mrs. Reed? Mrs. Reed? Aye. 
Are you able to unmute her? Or does she have to do it? Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Reed, if you can hear me, we just need you to unmute yourself so you can vote. Okay. Um, I'm just going to move on. Um, Mrs. Spade? Yes. I will also vote yes. And now, Mrs. Reed, I'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Motion carries. All right. Next up, we have education. Um, I do have some notes here that I'll pull up for, the, for my education liaison report. Um, the education liaisons met on March 9th, and we will be meeting again next week with Dr. Williams. Um, she provided updates to us on state assessments. Uh, at that time, there were no new updates since the board meeting. Um, she provided a Title IX update to us, which she will be doing a presentation on shortly, so I won't go into the details of that. She provided some great updates on some of the mental health initiatives um, that the district has been undertaking, including Read Across America Week, um, Spirit Weeks, uh, a program on promoting mental health resiliency in children and teens, um, programs by North Hill School District and Anchor Point, um, focus groups that are underway um, at, I know, at least the high school level, um, a staff wellness uh, collaborative, which is a group focused on raising awareness and offering support and resources for the overall health of our district staff, which um, when we met at the time it was going to be launching soon. Um, she provided an update on professional development. Um, uh, there was a survey sent out uh, the previous month with a focus on curriculum, data review, differentiation, pre-assessments, and um, grade, team, and department needs. And then she went over some of the curriculum writing, which is going to be happening this summer, um, including the tech ed department, school counselors, library media, science department, K through six math, and K through six computer science. So next I'd like to introduce Dr. Williams, who will be going over a Title IX overview. Good evening. If you recall, several board meetings ago, we discussed Title IX because I believe we did the board policy revision to board policy 236. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I was asked to provide an overview as to what Title IX looks like for the district. So very quickly, or in an easy summary, Title IX basically says that any school entity that is receiving federal funds must act in a non-discriminatory manner particularly with the emphasis with regard to someone's sex. So this has been around since the 1970s. This is not anything new, although it was recently updated in 2020. There are many different applications for Title IX. It looks a little bit different depending upon what level you're at, because again, this runs the gamut from K through 12, as well as students in colleges and universities or any educational program. So if you look, some of the key areas that they talk about with regard to Title IX are recruitment, admissions and counseling, financial assistance, athletics, again, sex-based harassment, discipline, all of those different issues fall under Title IX. Recent changes, as I said, just took place in August of 2020. And I think the biggest changes here that occurred with regard to that is when the federal courts found that sexual harassment was a form of sex discrimination under Title IX. So now, school districts must publicize how sexual harassment complaints are reported. We must have a mandatory response or protocol when there is a report of sexual harassment. And personnel now must need to be trained on Title IX complaints and what those procedures will look like. So for us, to ensure that we are doing that and complying with that, we have gone ahead and we have added, although this my mouse is, hang on one second. Uh, yep, that's not gonna. We have added to the website our Title IX procedures, and it can be found at the website on there and what that needs to look like, what the roles are and the responsibilities for that. I am obviously the person that you would be reporting those things to. 
I would be the person that you report a Title IX complaint to. I would also be the person that would be in charge of that investigation. Whereas then, I cannot, by law, be the person that makes that final decision. So if a Title IX complaint is brought to us, I can hear that complaint, I can investigate that complaint, but I cannot make a ruling on that. That ruling would be made by either Dr. Manorino or by Dr. Bazillo. It also goes on and gives you a form where if you wish to report your complaint, there's a form online for you to fill that out, depending upon whether you're a student filling out that report, or if you're considered to be um, under the age, I believe it is, of 16, your parent would then have to go ahead and co-sign that form. So there is a way for you to go ahead and fill out what that complaint would be. That is all located on our website. So if there are any questions, any concerns about Title IX, what our procedures are, how it would be handled, who does what, that is located on our website. The other important part of this is the training that is required in order for us to be compliant with Title IX. And I'm using the word staff because this is not just only teachers. It is any staff member. Our coaches already are trained. I know Mr. Weber works with them. They go through a Title IX training with regard to that. But this is training for everyone in the district to be aware of what our process is, what our procedures are, and what to do if for perhaps a student would after class say, hey, I need to talk to you about an issue, I have a concern, what would I would do? We want our staff members to be able, with a lot of comfort and confidence, to be able to answer that question for our students. The other part of this training has to be for our students. We do have to now publicize everywhere, on our website, in our handbooks, what our Title IX procedure is, and we have to be able to have those conversations with our students so they feel comfortable with what that looks like. Now, obviously, this is a K through 12 school district, so conversations about, you know, what would you do if someone said something that made you upset or uncomfortable at an elementary age would look markedly different than conversations we would be having with our senior high students. So we need to make sure that those conversations are handled and are developmentally appropriate. So we will be looking to provide that information developmentally appropriate to our students next year as well. And I also just want to make sure that you know that the initial training is going to align to the updated board policy and it's going to be in alignment with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, and what they're asking us to do and what is our guidelines from obviously the federal government with regard to that. I would also be remiss in saying if you have not seen there has been a recent um, update from OCR saying that they are now soliciting additional information regarding Title IX. They are going to literally be sending out surveys or making surveys available for parents, for students, for anyone who wishes to respond because they want to look back at this Title IX legislation and make sure that it is everything that we need to be doing. So you will be seeing that soon if you have not already seen it in the news under the OCR Office of Civil Rights soliciting additional information to determine if we need to amend this legislation in any way, shape, or form moving forward. Obviously, if that would change or there would be changes, we would comply with whatever those changes would be. Any questions for me about Title IX? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, this is, I, I, I'm sure that some of this goes without saying, but a lot of this is obviously confidential. Um, it's not something that we can expect to have here any sort of reporting on. Um, but you mentioned at the end about you know the surveys. I mean, is that the kind of thing that, that you would be regularly reporting to the board on, like our Title IX compliance, or is it just all sort of, you know? The complaints themselves and the investigatory process certainly are confidential, but we need to be public in the sense that we need to make sure that we can speak to what our procedures are, have we been trained, what does this need to look like. So it will always be included in professional development because I obviously do the professional development for the district. That will be an ongoing process of procedure with regard to that. And certainly if there is something more where I would say, yes, there's going to be um, the school counselors and our organization came in and spoke with our students today at the high school and they spoke specifically a component of that was Title IX. I can certainly provide that information to the board, but as far as the other information, it would indeed be confidential. Good question. Any other questions? Any, uh, Ms. Philpott, do you have any questions on Zoom? No, I'll just say thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams.
Okay, next we have a request that the board approve the IDEA use of funds agreement and notice of adoption of policies, procedures, and use of funds by the school district for the attached. And a request for the board to approve the AIU transition memorandum of understanding for the attached. I move that items three and four under education be added to the legislative meeting agenda. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? No? Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Ms. Cozera? Aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Ms. Philpott? Aye. Mrs. Poniatowski? Aye. Um, Mrs. Reed had to uh, leave us this evening, so she's no longer uh, online. Mrs. Spade? Yes. And I will also vote yes. Motion carries. And I will hand it over to Mrs. Poniatowski for athletics and activities. Um, we have three items under our place and activities. The first being um, that the board approved the continued recognition for club softball for 2021 and 2022 um, and approved the district reimbursement for the 2020 2021 school year in the amount of $261.37. Um, the next being that the board approved the continued recognition for ice hockey as a club sport for the 21-22 school year and approved the district reimbursement for the 2020-2021 school year uh, for the amount of $10,288.74. And also um, that the board approved the continued recognition of inline roller hockey as a club sport for the 2021-2022 school year and the reimbursement for the 2020-2021 school year in the amount of $1,509. And all three of these clubs um, have met the guidelines and qualifications set forth for continued recognition and reimbursement as per board policy 813, which is club sports. Um, and there's no request from the bowling club this year because the couple of students that showed interest um, chose not to participate. So we'll be looking for a new coach to bring bowling back next year. All right. So if there's any bowlers out there. <laughs> so I move that items two through four be added to the legislative meeting agenda. Okay, second. I will second it. <coughs> any discussion? Okay. Ms. Cozera? Aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Ms. Philpott? Aye. Mrs. Poniatowski? Aye. Mrs. Spade? Yes. I will also vote aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Poniatowski. Um, next, I will ask uh, Mrs. Spade to provide an update on AW Baby. Thank you. Um, for March and February, um, student of the month for Baby Tech. Carpentry building and construction, autumn academia. Health, science, and technology, Morgan, New, new me, and I apologize if I say your name wrong. Uh, HVAC, Gage Kennedy, Pastry Arts, Josie Barnes, Smartest, Julia Adink, Surgical Science um, is Nadia Allen. Thank you very much. You did a great job, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Mrs. Spade. Congratulations to those students. And um, you are still up with personnel. Okay. Personnel items are discussed in executive session. The superintendent recommends, and I so move, that the board approve personnel items one through three. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Okay. We'll move on to a vote. Ms. Cozera? Aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Ms. Philpott? Aye. Mrs. Poniatowski? Aye. Mrs. Spade? Yes. I will also vote aye. The motion carries. Thank you very much, Mrs. Spade. Next up, we have Mr. Little and Community and Intergovernmental Relations. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first, just a quick report. Uh, the rest of the team for the Community and Intergovernmental Relations we met uh, on April 1st uh, via Zoom with North Hills Community Outreach, uh, specifically with their executive director former North Hill School Board member Tom Baker, as well as a few of the other uh, 
I'm going to say leadership team over there, just talking about partnerships uh, and how we can help each other and getting messages out to help our community, families, and students, and things of that nature. So it, it was a positive meeting, and I believe that Mr. Bake will be coming here in the near future uh, to, to speak to the board about more, a little bit more about North Hills Community Outreach. Tonight, we have one uh, one thing on the, on the agenda here, one item I should say, excuse me, and that is the Memorandum of Understanding with the Ross Township and Westview Police Departments. Um, Tonight's description is the board approved the MOU as written and per attached between the North Hill School District and the Ross Township and Westview Police Departments. So I move that item two under community intergovernmental relations be added to the legislative meeting agenda. I'll second that, please, Betty. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, we'll move to a vote. Ms. Cozera? Aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Ms. Philpot? Aye. Mrs. Poniatowski? Aye. Mrs. Spade? Yes. I will also vote aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Little. Next, uh, we have Ms. Cozera and policy. Thank you. Um, for the policy liaison report, um, I wanted to note that we um, are almost through the review of some of the um, least frequent or least recently reviewed policies. Um, we've been working on that project for um, almost a year and a half now to kind of go through the policies and um, an update where needed. Um, and also, um, it's um, our wellness policy is due for an update, and so we will be. Um, I, I don't want to take um, Ms. Philpott's thunder from, I, I'm she's going to talk about that later, but um, but that's part of the process. We'll be doing that sort of in the next, in the coming meetings. Um, we'll be um, updating, we, the wellness committee has been meeting and, and policy updates, if needed, will be um, recommended. Um, so look for that in the future, but that's, you know, that's been in progress. Um, so that's, um, I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware of that. Um, I have an information item, which is the number of policies that um, that we have reviewed and have determined if changes were needed. Um, 411, seniority and suspensions. 428, salary determination. 512, evaluation of classified employees. 517, disciplinary procedures. 529, substitute compensation. And 622, 403B, retirement. Um, we have one policy for second reading, which is the policy 121, Title I Comparability of Services, um, which had some required revisions, um, and we discussed at our last meeting, and we did not receive any feedback on that policy or the respective changes, so the superintendent recommends, and I so move, that the board approve policy item three. I will second that, please, May. Any discussion? Okay, we'll move to a vote. Ms. Cozera? Aye. Mr. Little? Aye. Ms. Philpot? Aye. Mrs. Poniatowski? Aye. Mrs. Spade? Yes. I will also vote aye. Motion carries. Back to you, Ms. Cozera. Thanks. And finally, we have a couple of additional policies up for first reading with some um, more substantial changes. We have um, our policy 321, 421, and 521 dealing with political activities for um, for employees of the district, um, just making some updates to the language in that, um, in those policies. Um, we have under 809, we have some transportation policy revisions. Now I want to clarify that this is separate from the contract that we talked about and un actually unrelated to the contract. These are um, changes in state law that, um, that require some updates to our policy. And um, you'll see that the policy contemplates a um, third party providing our transportation. Um, the actual state requirements um, that were put in place deal, the lay in the language that we had to work with deal with um, employees of the district um, needing to, you know, go through certain clearances and that sort of thing. And, um, and we are, you know, we're saying that the, our, our third party um, carrier is providing that, you know, that confirmation and, um, and that, we are, that we are compliant with the law and as are they. And then the final one is um, policy 914, um, relations with the intermediate union, um, some revisions to that um, policy as well. 
So um, I move that policy items five through nine be added to the legislative meeting agenda. I'll second that, please, Wade. Um, any discussion? I'm sorry, Mike, I have an iPad issue. Um, is there any discussion? And we have an update to that. 
you, Ms. Philpott. Um, we will next move on to the uh, Westview Ad Hoc Committee. I have a brief update on that. Um, a request for proposal has been published for construction management services for this project. Several companies have already expressed interest and site visits are being accommodated upon request. Proposals are due April 16th, 2021, and then the committee will be evaluating the responses shortly thereafter and we'll have another update for the public. Okay, at this time I will ask if we have any public comments on non-agenda items. Um, there's nobody attending in person, but perhaps on Zoom. If you do have a public comment on a non-agenda item, please raise your hand virtually. Okay. Nobody? All right. The next meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for next Thursday, week for today, April 15th, 2021, um, right here in the North Hills Middle School LGI room at 7 p.m. Um, I also want to let you know that the North Hills High School Drama Club's Spring Musical Songs for a New World will be shown online next Friday, April 16th, and Saturday, April 17th. The pre-recorded and edited show will be streamed as a live event beginning at 7 p.m. each night, and tickets can be purchased for $10 per device online at um, showticksforyou.com, which is linked from the North Hills website. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see this um, for personal reasons because my son is in it, but I also always love our high school productions. So um, this is uh, really exciting for us, and um, I'm sure a lot of people will be watching as well. Okay, uh, with no other items this evening, I will move to adjourn the meeting. Have a good evening, everyone.